Hi, fellow scientists. I have a really important message for you today on Echo Live. We've had to cancel our previously scheduled program because there's been a crime committed right here in the Michigan Science Center's Echo Distance Learning Studio. I'm hoping, though, that maybe we could take this time to learn a little bit about forensic science and maybe, just maybe, you can help me solve this crime using chemistry. Now, we're calling this episode of Echo Live Forensic. Oh no, I'm hoping that we're not muted. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty with my new set of microphones. They're causing me a little bit of trouble lately. Um, so I've switched my microphone. If you can hear me, could you let me know now in the chat? Um, I appreciate everyone that's told me so far that they can't hear me. Um, it looks like across our different platforms, we're having some different results, which is eh, not my favorite thing, but let me know if you can hear me now. Uh, give me a thumbs up. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can give me a thumbs up reaction. If you're in Zoom, you can do so as well. Let me know if you're able to hear me now and I will start my spiel all over. Now, unfortunately, we've had to change our Echo Live programming today because there has been a very serious crime committed. Someone broke into the Michigan Science Center's Echo Distance Learning Studio and they stole my lunch. But I'm hoping that we can learn a little bit about forensic science today that we can work together, do some investigation of this evidence and solve this very, very serious crime using chemistry. So we've got a pretty interesting plan going on today. We've got some evidence to take a look at. Um, remember that of course, throughout the program, if you'd like to communicate with me, like telling me that maybe you can't hear me, which is super important and I appreciate, make sure you're using that chat feature. I've got lots of questions and I'll definitely need your feedback because we're going to solve this crime together. Uh, like we said, we're calling this episode of Echo Live, we're calling it Forensic Files, which is one of my favorite TV shows if you're into true crime like I am. But this is a lesson that we've also adapted from a BASF kids lab. Now, BASF is a chemical company based right here in Michigan out of Southfield and Wyandotte. And they design kids labs, which teach people about real life applications of chemistry. And one of the applications of chemistry we've talked about is how we can use chemistry in forensic scientists, science. So like we said, the crime committed today, someone out there stole my lunch. And we are going to try to solve this crime using chromatography. Now chromatography is the science of separating something into its individual parts. You can think of this, for example, if I had a birthday cake and I were to perform chromatography on a birthday cake, metaphorically, what are some of the separate components that make up a birthday cake? What sorts of things go into a birthday cake? So if we were to use chromatography to separate that birthday cake into all of its individual components or individual pieces, what are some pieces we might get? Um, so this is just a metaphorical way of thinking about chromatography before we actually start the setup of our procedure today. So tell me in the chat, if we were to do chromatography on a birthday cake, what are some of those individual pieces or components that we might be left with after we do chromatography, separating these, this cake into its individual parts? Um, when you've got an answer, as always, type it in the chat form. Let me know what you think. What are some individual components, or maybe you could think of them as ingredients that we would get out of our birthday cake? Uh, Zoe and Zoom tells me that we might get flour. So flour is certainly one ingredient in cake. Um, so we might get flour. Um, Courtney tells me that we could get frosting. 
um, and cake. So maybe just thinking about what makes up our final composition of this birthday cake here. Um, looking at this one, right, we definitely have candles, eggs, flour, sugar, milk, oil. Great answers, everybody. So we're starting to understand the very, very basic premise of chromatography. Now, we wouldn't necessarily use chromatography on a birthday cake, but what we can um, use chromatography for is to separate ink into its individual parts. So we have got four different types of writing utensils because the only evidence that was discovered at the scene of our missing sandwich crime was this note right here. So our suspect left behind this handwritten note that says, thanks for lunch, you will never catch me. Now we dusted this note for fingerprints prior to the program and unfortunately we didn't find anything. So no fingerprints to be found. But what our suspect did not realize is that the ink you written or that this note was written with can be very, very telling as well. So even though we might not find fingerprints, which are certainly one type of evidence that we can find at crime scenes, we can investigate this note even closer using chemistry. Now we have four suspects to this crime and we'll meet them just a little bit later on. We'll go through our suspects here, um, but each suspect was caught with a different black marker. So we've got a note written in black marker. We narrowed our subject pool down to four people. And these four people um, were discovered with these four different writing utensils at the scene of the crime or at, on the time of the crime. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use chromatography to separate the ink from these markers and then compare it to the chromatography that we've done um, on the note from the crime. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at our setup here. So let's take a look at our note first. You can see that the note was written in this black marker, but we've actually snipped a very small piece of our note. And we've done that process of chromatography right here, which separated the black ink into its individual components. So black ink is not usually just made up of black ink. It's made up of all different color ink. And so as our chromatography process happened, it separated the ink into its individual pieces. So we'll come back to that note. We'll talk a little bit more about how chromatography works once we get our experiment set up. Now, what I've done before the program is I've poured just a little bit of water into each of these beakers and I've labeled them, which is going to be very, very important um, for this lesson or for this activity, right? Because we wanna make sure that we don't mix up or contaminate any of our evidence. Um, I've also labeled the markers. So we've got marker A, marker B, marker C, and marker D. Um, so everything is labeled. That way we have no confusion and we're sure that we're getting good results from our experiment here. Now, what we're going to do um, in order to turn this into a chromatography experiment is we're going to use each of the writing utensils that we've gotten from each of our suspects and we're going to perform chromatography on them. So I've got some filter paper here um, similar to the filter paper that the note was written on. And I'm just going to take each marker on a separate piece of filter paper. And I'm going to draw a line, um, just about half an inch from the bottom of the filter paper. So we've got A, we've got A, so we'll just set that one right there for now. We've got B, we've got Marker C from suspect C. And we're just doing that same thing. We're doing the same setup. Um, so we're being consistent between each of our markers that we've confiscated as evidence. And then marker D. All right, so each of them, I've drawn a line about half an inch or so from the bottom of the filter paper. And now we need to drop this down inside the liquid. So if we take a closer look at exactly how the process of chromatography works, the setup looks something like this, which is what we are going to do in each of these beakers. Now, this is a label diagram of a chromatographic chamber. So number one represents the chamber itself where we might do chromatography inside a closed system. 
Number two is the filter paper. And so we've used the filter paper to draw a line with our marker that we're trying to separate into those individual components of ink. Uh, number three on this is the solvent front, which is the movement of this liquid solvent that's down here in the bottom of our container. For our experiment, we are using water as our liquid solvent. Um, and that water is going to travel up the filter paper very slowly. But as it goes, it's going to take the dye from that marker with it. And you'll notice that it starts to separate that dye into different layers of color. Um, so the important parts of chromatography are a stationary phase, which is something that does not move. So in this case, it is the filter paper and a mobile phase, which is normally something like this liquid um, when we're doing something like ink chromatography. So let's get that process all set up inside each of our beakers here. We'll go ahead and we will attach a paper clip here, which is just going to allow us to put one of these plastic drinking straws through the top and then set the end of the fil filter paper down into the liquid. Now, the line that I drew on the paper is actually not going underneath the water. We want the mobile phase, the water, to actually carry the dye up the paper itself. So we don't want to submit or um, submerge the filter paper down in the water. We just want the water to be able to be absorbed by the filter paper and then be carried up the paper itself. Now this one's a little long, so we'll fold over the top. Because again, we wanna make sure that we're not submerging our filter paper, or the line that we drew on the filter paper down into the water itself. We wanna keep that line above the water and just allow our mobile phase to carry it with it. All right, we've got C. And then of course, lastly, we have D, which was our, that marker right there. All right. Now, this process takes a little bit of time. You can see that the water is starting to slowly travel up, at least our first um, marker, uh, marker A, which we got from one of our suspects. So while we wait for this process of chromatography to work, let's meet our subjects or let's meet our suspects. Here we go. All right, let's meet the suspects. This is our note. And so you can see that we cut a little piece there, just like I showed you before. Um, this is the note that was discovered at the scene of the crime. So in place of my sandwich, which I had was looking forward to all morning, looking forward to eating my ham and cheese sandwich. Um, this is the note we found at the scene and we've snipped a little piece of this coffee filter, which works just as well as filter paper as the stuff that I put inside these beakers. So if you're looking to recreate this experiment at home, a coffee filter, just like the one, one that this note was written on, works just as well. All right, suspect number one is Raul, the rock star scientist. Now, if you remember Raul, he's been featured on Echo Live a couple times. Now, Raul claims that he was away on tour with his popsicle stick harmonica band during the time of the crime, so he could not possibly have taken my lunch from the distance learning studio. But that alibi has yet to be confirmed. And so until we do so, until we solidify that alibi, Raul remains a suspect, mainly because Raul loves ham and cheese sandwiches. I would argue that ham and cheese sandwiches are probably Raul's favorite food. And I could tell maybe he was a little jealous that I had brought ham and cheese sandwiches for lunch this week and that I did not bring one for him. So motive, I think so. Raul was caught with the vis-a-vis -vis wet erase marker in his lab coat pocket on the day of the crime, which is exhibit A here in our chromatography experiment that's taking place on my table. So we've confiscated one of his vis-a-vis -vis wet erase markers and we are running that chromatography test. Suspect number two, Penguin Pete. Now, Penguin Pete is known to hold a little bit of a grudge since we vacuum packed him during episode three of Echo Live. I may or may not have forgotten to take Penguin Pete out of the trash bag for a couple hours after the program. And I think it's just left a little bit of a bad taste in his mouth. If you don't remember that episode, it's episode three of Echo Live. You'll see that vacuum packing is really fun. 
And Penguin Pete loves that experiment, but maybe forgetting him about him in the bag made him a little bit upset. Now, Penguin Pete claims he's a vegetarian, but I did happen to see him eating a filet of fish sandwich last week for lunch, so questionable on that. Now, Penguin Pete was discovered writing with a Crayola marker on the day of the crime. So we've confiscated that Crayola marker and we're running chromatography and that is exhibit B. All right, suspect number three, Paulette, our staff astronomer who's also been featured here on Echo Live and she actually happened to be spotted inside the Echo Studio just before the time my sandwich went missing. You know it was here this morning. Paulette happened to stop by the studio and then magically my sandwich goes missing? Hmm, suspicious if you ask me, but Paulette is known to be gluten-free, meaning she wouldn't eat the wheat bread that I had put my ham and cheese sandwich on. So her motive for taking the sandwich is pretty unclear to me. Now, when I asked Paulette, she said she only writes with Mr. Sketch washable markers, which is the marker set up in Beaker C up here on our distance learning table. Now, lastly, our last suspect is Keyboard the Clown Cat. She's known for causing a little bit of mischief and she really likes to pull practical jokes. If you happen to catch our static electricity episode of Echo Live, Keyboard surprised me by jumping up on the table in the middle of an experiment because she thought it would be so funny. I'm not quite sure, but she is known for being a little bit of a trickster. And so maybe that's her reason for stealing my lunch. But Keyboard says that without thumbs, it would be impossible for her to have left the nut. However, I did find a Mr. Sketch scented marker in her cat carrier once I was looking through her stuff today. So if she doesn't have thumbs and it's impossible for keyboard to write the note, what reason could she possibly have to have the scented marker in her cat carrier? All this to say, our four suspects, none of them have been completely cleared, meaning we're going to have to rely on the evidence of the experiment that we're doing up here on the table. Now, based on our descriptions of our four suspects, go ahead and weigh in. Tell me who do you think might have committed the crime? You've met all these suspects before. They've all featured here on an episode of Echo Live. Um, so as a character witness, maybe you want to vouch for some of these people. Maybe maybe some of you happen to be at Raul's uh, Popsicle Stick Harmonica game. Yeah, I see a lot of people, I... Hmm. Cassie tells me that she agrees. Keyboard Cat is pretty shifty, and I would say so too. She really does love to pull those tricks. Hmm. Lots of people chiming in, right? But we're unsure which happens when we're doing investigations, right? We really have to prove it based on the evidence. Um, we can make our assumptions and we can use our reference, right? We can think about um, the history of these suspects, how well we know them, how well we trust them, but ultimately it's going to come down to, can we prove it based on the evidence up here on the screen? Now, chromatography, right, we said is separating the ink into its individual components. So we said that black ink is not just black. Um, it's made up of different dyes, which also have different densities or weights to them, which are going to allow them to travel up the mobile phase at different speeds. Now, you can think of this like mixing colors, right? Because black ink is usually the combination of all colors mixed together. Um, we can do this using ink by mixing different colored dyes together, which would give us something that appears black, like these paddles here in my hand, but it's really made up of all different kind of frequencies um, or wavelengths of light or different types of dye. So I've got all sorts of different colors here. Um, this one's green, so it looks like my virtual background. Um, but in combination, they turn into black dye. But some dyes are heavier um, than others. Now, now that we've kind of thought about our suspects, right, we really need to get down to the evidence. We really need to prove this based on what we know um, about the markers that our suspects write with. So let's take a closer look at each of our um, samples here. So let's zoom back in on the table or zoom back in on our experiment. Ooh, some people thinking that maybe there was no crime at all, that maybe I ate the sandwich? How could you? No trust here on Echo Live. I thought we knew each other well enough by now, but let's take a look. So let's take a look at our evidence. So we'll take each of our samples out of the beaker and we can lay them here on the table. So we had 
A, our visa V marker, which was found with Raoul. We've got B, our Crayola marker, which was found with Penguin Pete. We've got C, our washable Mr. Sketch marker, which was found with Paulette. And then we've got D, our Mr. Sketch scented marker from Keyboard Cat's Carrier. Um, but really the only way we can take an up close look at these um, is by comparing it to our written notes. So I'm gonna switch my camera over to my document cam here. And let's take a look at the note a bit closer. Ooh, fancy. Of course, we'll need to turn off our virtual background. Now we don't have any sort of nagging doubts about if we're getting a good enough look at our evidence here. All right, so we've got our note. And then here is our original sample of chromatography that we've done using the note found at the crime scene. So you can see that starting from here, or I believe it's starting from there. Yep. So starting from here, which was this upper part of the Y, starting from here, our dye separated this way. So to, from the pink to the green, which tells us that the pink dye must be much heavier or denser than the green dye because the pink dye was harder to move um, with the mobile phase. So as our liquid traveled from this point up the filter paper, um, the pink dye is much heavier, therefore harder to move than the green dye. So keep in mind the order of these dyes because that is very, very important. If it's helpful, we'll turn the note this way. That way we can compare our samples. So let's first look at marker A. So again, the wet erase marker was Raoul's. We found this in Raoul's lab coat pocket. And let's take a look at the evidence. Does the pattern of these colors, does the pattern of the dye that we've separated using chromatography, does it match the chromatography done on the note found at the crime scene? Tell me what you think. Hmm, yeah, lots of people telling us that it doesn't quite match up, right? So in this note, we see definitely pink turning into green and then kind of continuing on, but this wet erase marker is very, very different. This wet erase marker is made up of, com of a combination of yellow and pink and purple and then maybe even blue as it starts to separate even further. So pretty unlikely based on this evidence that Raoul was the one who wrote the note. All right, let's take a look at our next piece of evidence. Marker B was Penguin Pete's. This marker was Penguin Pete's. Um, it is the Crayola marker that we found with him on the day of the crime. What do we think? Look closely. We've got pink to green. And we said that this one was still working. So, hmm, I would say based on these patterns, it's pretty hard to rule him out as of yet. So let's take a look at our next marker. The next one is the Mr. Sketch washable marker, which was Poet's writing utensil of choice. What do we think? Does the Mr. Sketch washable marker, does this match up? Hmm. No, I agree. So lots of our forensic scientists out there telling us that these aren't even close. So again, pretty unlikely that Paulette was the one who left the note since she only writes with these Mr. Sketch washable markers. So, all right, we'll set that one off to the side. Let's take a look at our last piece of evidence. This was the Mr. Sketch scented marker that we found with keyboard. What do we think about that one? Remember, look very carefully. Are the colors the same? So we said we had kind of a pink fading to a green. So pink to green. Um, this looks to me more like red to blue. So red and blue looks like we still have some separation that could have gone. Um, lots of people starting to figure out the answer now. So let's line back up our evidence. So we've got um, oops, A, B, C, and D. Now, if you were to compare to these four samples, if you were to compare each of these four samples, remember A, B, C, and D, which would you say is the closest match to the chromatography done on the note from our crime scene? Tell me, what do you think? A, B, C, or D? That's 
of people. Remember, it's okay to take a moment to think about your answer because this is very important stuff here. Um, but I think I agree with lots of people telling us that sample B taken from Penguin Pete's marker is the closest match to our writing sample that we found at the crime scene. Now I've done this more than once. So before the program, I also took this sample. And that one looks even more similar, in my opinion, to the one found at the crime scene. So we've got pink fading into green, pink to green, pink to green. The order of the color matches and the makeup of that ink matches as well. So I'm feeling pretty confident telling, saying that Penguin Pete was the one that stole my lunch. Um, from the distant learning studio today. Now I can understand it, right? Cause we did say that I did accidentally leave Penguin Pete in the garbage bag for a couple hours following the program, but he looks so cute in there. He didn't seem to mind that we vacuum packed him, but um, I've learned my lesson that maybe I should be a little bit nicer to Penguin Pete and maybe that I do owe him um, a sandwich for lunch next time. So thank you everybody for helping us to solve this very, very, uh, serious, just kidding, not so serious crime um, that was committed in the Echo Distance Learning Studio using our knowledge of chemistry and forensic science. So um, this is the end of Echo Live today. If you have questions about this, feel free to ask in the chat. I would love to answer some of those questions if you have them. Um, otherwise, of course, we're going to take this moment as normal to thank the sponsors of the Michigan Science Center like Ford and Denzo, who allow us to bring these programs to you every weekday at 2.30 p.m. These programs are free, and we are so excited to see so many people joining in every day, learning about STEM and engaging in STEM at home. Of course, we hope we'll see you back here tomorrow um, at 2.30 p.m. for another episode of Echo Live. We'll take a look at some fun science tricks and teach you the science behind them so that you're able to do some of those science tricks with your friends or your family at home and impress them with all of your different science knowledge. Um, someone asked, how did I transfer the ink from the sign to the coffee filter? Um, actually, this note was left on a coffee filter itself. And so if you look at it kind of closely, um, the note was actually written on a coffee filter. It's kind of hard to see because I actually just laminated it here to this uh, piece of paper. That way I could preserve our evidence. That way it could no longer be contaminated but it was actually written on the coffee filter itself, which made it really easy to perform chromatography um, on a piece of that filter paper. Now, filter paper, like we said, works really, really well for chromatography and coffee filters um, are something that you could really easily get at the grocery store to try ink chromatography yourself. Uh, I, a couple of people suggesting that maybe it was a setup. So if we don't feel confident in our evidence as always, right, we might need to do some further investigation. Um, maybe we can interview Penguin Pete and see if we can get him to admit that it was him. Um, so that would be um, probably a good indication that he did commit this crime. But I feel you that if you're not confident, right, it wouldn't make sense um, to uh, convict or to arrest Penguin Pete unless we had better evidence or more confidence in our evidence. So I love that you're so inquisitive um, and that you guys are looking for these different kinds of evidence. Um, don't worry about Penguin Pete. He's totally fine. He's living his best life here because he got that ham and cheese sandwich for lunch today and I did not. All right. Thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, keep sending your suggestions, keep sending your questions if you've got them, we'd be happy to keep answering them. Um, otherwise, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and we will see you back